Welcome to LAST 201, Popular Culture in Latin America. And today I'm very pleased to be talking to Shaylee Wellman um, from the Anthropology Department here at UBC, who is the author of uh, When I Wear My Alligator Boots, which I like so much that I have two copies. And uh, we're going to be talking about the chapter in here, uh, A Narco Without a Corrido Doesn't Exist. So, Shaylee, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, John. And I thought I'd just kick off with a question. I mean, the subtitle of this book is uh, Narco Culture in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. And in the chapter, you also talk about an emerging narco culture. And I wonder if you could just briefly um, talk about what you might mean or what we might mean by narco culture. Yeah, I, I think of narco culture as being um, a term to refer to a whole set of different kinds of cultural formations that have emerged over the last couple of decades that are about the impact of drug trafficking, um, the drug trade in Mexico, and that often valorize different elements of it. Um, so it's not just narco corridos, which I think is a quintessential example, but also um, telenovelas, narco telenovelas that are, you know, they're like soap operas that will represent different drug traffickers, famous capos and things like that. There's also a whole set of different kinds of religious symbolism that have emerged, a kind of popular Catholicism um, that is about drug culture. Like there's a, there's a narco saint, Jesus Malverde, um, who's considered not just to be the narco saint for narco traffickers, but also the angel of the poor. And um, often drug traffickers will, will pray to this saint and wear little emblems that represent him. There's also a whole set of, of like fashion elements that are associated with narco culture, which in the 1990s and the early, two, um, the, the early uh, 2000s, they were really kind of indexed like the rancher culture um, out of which a lot of, of narcos had, had emerged. So like wide buckled belts and big cowboy hats and things like that. So it's a whole set of different kind of interrelated elements. And I should mention though, that that kind of the fashion sense around drug traffickers has changed quite a lot as have like the, the music over the past couple of decades. So like any kind of cultural form, it's not fixed changing and very hybrid. Like it incorporates elements from popular culture and has become more globalized over the last couple of years. So it's kind of an amorphous set of practices that I think are associated with the drug trade in, in, in Mexico, but, and specifically Northern Mexico. So I really liked in the, in the chapter, one of the things I really liked, uh, I liked lots of things, was the way in which you so it sort of permeates the atmosphere. And in fact, you didn't really sort of pay attention to it uh, to start off with. Uh, it was just there and the little kids were dancing. And then at, at one point, there's a little anecdote, there's lots of great little anecdotes here in which I think you turn to someone and say, all these songs are about narcos. And they're like, yes, that's that's kind of the point. They, they are about narcos. But I'm interested in, about the way in which it's, it sort of, um, this narco culture is sort of part of the, I don't know, part of the furniture, right? It, it, it's there, it could be seen, but not seen at the same time. I don't know if you could say any more about that. Yeah, that's a really good observation because in rereading the chapter, it's really about me trying to make sense of something that I, I really wasn't aware of when I first started working in Mexico. And so I, I went to Mexico for the first time as a graduate student, and it was in 2005, and my plan was, was not to do anything related to, to drugs. I was planning to ignore all that and hopefully avoid it because for obvious reasons, it seemed dangerous. Um, but in thinking I could avoid it, I was obviously totally underestimating how much it's just a part of everyday life there. And so my first introduction to this music was just listening to it at different social events and parties. And, and I actually really enjoyed it. It's really upbeat music. It feels, it makes people happy. And so um, it was just a kind of slow process of of not even like kind of listening to the lyrics, but not really like people would dance to it. And then the more I listened to the music, so it was, I could see it was a lot of very violent. And then yeah, I thought it was a very good observation on my part that there seemed to be a lot, a lot of narcos, but of course it's this whole genre, which is specifically about narcos. Um, so yeah, I think that the, a lot of the chapter is structured around me trying to come to terms with that. So at first it seemed really weird that people would have would be so happy and celebrating these narcos. But the more I thought about it, 
the more I could make sense of it. And so that was the process for me. I, I love the way, incidentally, uh, not just in this chapter, but in the book, you know, it, it so much revolves around your reactions and your responses to, to what you're seeing and your uh, conversations with people. And, and I want to ask about the, the upbeat, the nature of the songs in a minute. But one of the things about the corrido, and you mentioned the naco corrido, is it doesn't exactly come from nowhere, right? There, there is a, a pre-existing tradition of the corrido, especially associated with the Mexican Revolution, but, but, but not just. And I wonder if you could talk about both the ways in which the naco corrido, the continuities, um, what it shares with those earlier corridos, and maybe ways in which it's different in some way. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because uh, making sense of why narco corridos are so important still, you have to put it in that historical context. And those first corridos, I mean, corridos as a genre used to be about revolutionary heroes. So Pancho Villa, who was a popular um, military leader in the Mexican revolution, but also people like Joaquin Murrieta, who is an infamous bandit in, in Baja, California and Sonora, sort of a Robin Hood character. So all those first um, corridos that were about those kinds of figures. And I think understanding why, um, why con contemporary people are st still have these positive associations with narco traffickers now is about the way that that figure of the narco trafficker connects to those older revolutionary popular heroes. And I think one of the things they have in common is that they're positioned really similar, similarly in relation to long-term configurations of structural power on the border, like the dichotomy between the US and Mexico, between the elite and the non-elite, between the poor and the rich. And, um, and these narcotraficantes are often associated with in that same kind of way, like they, they had to experience social injustice and poverty and they, they rose and overcame those kinds of um, experiences and now they're powerful and successful. So for people who've experienced these um, th these kinds of inequalities on the border and a, peop and a, and a particularly working class people or people in poverty, um, they connect to that and that feeling of power that that brings, I think, um, really profoundly. So it's an it's important connection, um, but there's also differences, right? I mean, the more recent narco corridos are much more violent. There's also like a whole um, subclass of corridos where people, anybody can can commission a corrido. You could, if you wanted to, John, you could hire someone to write a song about you and give them some I will. tidbits. I will, them. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of, of differences as well, but I think that continuity is absolutely crucial to understand why they're so important today. So one of the things that um, seems to come out from the, the, the corridos that you talk about it, and as you just described it too, is that they are about the the people who rise to the top of the of the um, of the drug the cartel narco uh, hierarchy um, who triumph in some ways. And you actually you end the chapter by talking briefly about what they don't mention, right? And what is what is occluded. So th there's in some ways they tell they tell the way things are, they, they tell the, the, their form of informing people about how things are, but they're also, there's also other things that they leave to one side. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that combination of um, realism, I suppose, and a, a certain distortion or marginalization of other aspects of everyday life. Yeah, I think what you're referring to, at, at the end, I start to think about the way that they, they valorize the successes of these drug traffickers but I mean, one thing that they leave out is the fact that most of these guys do end up in jail anyway. I mean, it's not a total success story. They also experience a lot of violence, but also it kind of ignores other aspects of the impact of, of drug trafficking on this reason, re region and elsewhere, you know, drug addiction and how that affects people and um, other kinds of forms of violence around, um, around the drug trade more specifically. Um, and, and of course the devastation that occurs to many communities where, where young men and women spend years of their life in jail. I mean, especially those people who are at the lower ends of this trade. I mean, these songs are generally about um, the famous successful drug traffickers, although there are many 
songs that are, as I said, commissioned for everyday people. Um, but they don't get into that. They don't get into those more long-term devastating everyday effects of the way prohibition policies have affected people in this region. So this connects back to something you, you mentioned earlier, and, and I kind of try to flag it as well, the way in which they're very upbeat, right? They're, they're songs that you can uh, dance to. And, and there seems to be perhaps a bit of um, a, a tension or a contradiction between this upbeat affect, this sort of high energy form and a content which is about death and, and violence, right? These are not elegies, but perhaps they should be elegies, right? But they're not, right? They are, they, they are yes, upbeat dance tunes. How, how do you explain or, or what, what kind of ways do you think about that? Yeah, I think that juxtaposition is probably the most salient for people who are coming to this for the first time, or, or for me especially, like realizing what these songs I'd been happily kind of singing along to or dancing um, to for all this time, and then realizing how violent they were and how dark these themes were. And um, they're really, it's really upbeat music with accordions and tubas. And, um, and I think part of the problem is that a lot of the public discourse, especially in Mexico and beyond about this is, um, is that violent music is, would create more violence. And therefore, how can people be so happy and cheery about it? Um, but one of the things I try to argue is that it doesn't just, you know, it's not just about that. This kind of music generates all sorts of things. And in this case, I think, um, one of the most important things that it generates that's often overlooked is like certain kinds of feelings, like feelings of, of power that makes people feel powerful, makes people feel pride. They're, they're not just ballads, but they're often thought of as anthems. They're really Mexican, you know, they make you feel Mexican. Um, and also feelings of defiance and um, of potential hope. Uh, so it's, it, I, I think it, it is contradictory, obviously, because violence is, is negative and has negative impacts, but these songs are, do more than that. And it's not just about the violence and it's not just about the, the literal interpretation of the words, but it's about the way they make people feel. Um, I was interested in the, yeah, that, that, yeah that's, that's all fantastic. I was interested in the notion of the Mexicanness of this, right? There's a sort of like a sort of alternative sense of um, uh, of national identity that, that emerges here. Um, I mentioned that because it, it for two reasons. One, it bypasses the state, right? You know, the, these these are these are these are people who are, are, are in a war with the state, or the state is a, a war with them. Um, but also, though we're talking about borderlands, right? We're talking about flows across um, uh, the border. We're talking about an enterprise as fundamentally transnational. Um, I don't know if you could talk about this, the sense of the construction of, of a, Nash, a sense of Mexicanist at the border through this music or through these songs. Yeah, well, I, start, I first started thinking about that because there is a quote. I think I have it in the chapter from yep. one of the most famous... Um, uh, women who's also a uh, narco corista, Jenny Rivera, and she says in, in response to these criticisms, she says they make people feel Mexican. Um, and I think that that's really true. And, and in part, it's because of what you just flagged there, this opposition, especially in the borderlands between the US and Mexico, and a real awareness that local people have about the ironies of, of drug prohibition. You know, they, um, the reason that Mexico has become this huge producing country is because the northern border is the largest consumer of drugs. And so there's a real hypocrisy with the kinds of laws in place and the way that they have negatively impacted Mexican citizens because this, this trade exists because of this, this huge demand in the United States. And some, and, and some of the corridos actually mention that, you know, this is because of the United States. Um, and, I, and I remember people talking in, in this village about the fact that, yeah, the, the, that there's a quote actually, the father in the house that I lived in said at one point that the US is the boss of Mexico and everything except for drugs. And <laughs> I think what he meant by that really was just that, you know, the US in, is in a relationship of dependency that it doesn't want to admit on some level. Um, but of course, it's also important to note that these songs are not popular among all Mexicans at all. And there's a lot of, um, it's a very kind of, as an, as an instance of 
popular culture in the context of this course. It's, I think it's a great example. It may be a complicated one though, because it's not, it's very, it's kind of a subculture. It's in the North, it's very class dependent. Like it's very working class, lower class. Um, a lot of more upper class people have expressed disdain. I mean, everybody has a kind of contradictory relationship with the genre. Um, but there's definitely this feeling that there's it's something very Mexican about it. Yeah. There's the there's the gendered aspect as well. You mentioned uh, again another of your anecdotes is about um, I think a young girl uh, or maybe not so young. Anyway, she, she says I don't really like them. I prefer musica romantica. I prefer, I prefer you know romantic music, love songs, and then she puts on a nago corrido, and I think it's her brother or someone else says you see you you do like them after all. Um, so, which I thought was interesting. And, and, and the fact that you've got uh, um, the Jenny, uh, the, the singer that you mentioned, I forget her surname now, right? You've, you've got w- right, women yeah. here. H- how, do, how do women feature in perhaps in narco culture more generally, as well as just in the narco corridos? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because if you think about like the, the character of the narco traficante, it's a defiant character that's breaking the rules. So more recently, I think you can see women who are narcos, which is, uh, you know, that they exist as well. They also kind of fit that profile perfectly because it kind of goes against gender norms in some ways. Um, but it's also very empowering. So it is interesting, though, that women seem to explicitly express more ambivalence to to the genre and I, I'm the same way you know if someone asked me if I like the music I would feel quite sheepish and talk about things that I don't like or why it's problematic but it makes me feel powerful and happy when I hear these songs of course it has memories associated with it for me but it's just upbeat really like invigorating music um, so I think that certainly women seem to um, feel more of a responsibility to express those negative emotions due to kind of societal gender expectations um, about what women should think and feel about such things and about violence in particular. But it's widespread, this ambivalence. So we're about out of time. I, I don't know if there's something that we should have mentioned that, that you'd like to um, uh, point out from the, from the chapter about the Naco Gorridos. No, the only thing I'd like to mention is that I hope that obviously you won't have time to play a narco corrido here, but if you if you search narco corridos on YouTube, you can see a whole range of incredible examples. So I really hope that this class will get the opportunity to actually see some narco corridos and listen to them to get a sense of what we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to put put one on, but I thought it might get taken down for. I mean, the video was taken down for copyright uh, reasons. But we will right, be listening yeah. to Narco Corridos and um, maybe we will also feel enthused and energized ambivalently as a result <laughs> of doing so. So Shaylee, thanks so much. Thanks so much for your time, um, for your chapter, for your book and, and for chatting to us about this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.